Wonderful. Nice to see um, so many, so many familiar faces and some new faces. So if you're not familiar with IORPIC, it is a small organization in the executive office of the president designed to coordinate US federal agency efforts under the Arctic Research and Policy Act. Through our community of practice, the Atmospheric Group offers contributions to the implementation of a new five-year US Arctic Research Plan. In 2023, the Atmospheric Community of Practice plans to primarily support the advancement of Arctic Systems Interactions Priority Area with the specific objective um, 2.1, which is the Arctic amplification and connections to lower latitudes. In addition, we're hoping to advance efforts under the community resilience and health priority area related to Arctic air quality wildfires and the health effects. So um, we are excited today to have two speakers. Um, the, the first is Lubna Dada from the Paul Scher Institute, and she's going to talk about a central Arctic extreme aerosol event triggered by a warm air, a warm air mass intrusion. And Lubna, you want to share your screen? So that that looks good. You can begin when you when you want. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thanks a lot. I'm actually very excited to be here. Uh, most of you are. Uh, new faces to me and I'm very happy to be here. So I will tell you today about uh, my work, which uh, most of it uh, happened when I was at another lab in Switzerland known as the Extreme Environments Research Laboratory at EPFL. But now I'm a scientist at the Paul Scherer Institute and I will guide you through this extreme event. So I'm not here to tell you about what is happening in the Arctic, but I will show you some of the, um, let me see if this works. Okay, some of the breaking news that accompanied this um, one air mass intrusion. So we know that the Arctic is warming up, up to four times more than before, that the year 2020 was the second warmest year on record, that the sea ice in September 2020 has shrunk so much and uh, a recent uh, news article has shown that Northerners, this was mainly in Canada, showing that the future might be uh, much more cloudier, that we will miss seeing the Northern Lights, uh, first world problems, of course, but, but still. And here that an extraordinary heat wave in 2020 has hit and the Arctic sea ice extent has been decreasing so much compared to the Northern Ridge and um, this is basically the same. So this event that I will be speaking about happened in April 2020, when um, during the Mosaic expedition, which is an expedition that took place between September 2019 and September 2020, where this um, it was the largest polar expedition in history, where the German research icebreaker Polarstern, which you see in the in the picture to the right has uh, drifted uh, in the ice between uh, Norway up to the Central Arctic Ocean and drifted in the ice for one year. So our part of the work is about atmospheric aerosols. And I show you here the container which contained uh, measurements of uh, chemical and physical properties of the atmospheric aerosols. So basically how many there are, what are they composed of and so on and um, the, the container was placed on the deck in the picture to the right. So my colleagues on the boat have experienced what is called as a warm and moist air mass intrusion. And I hope you can see my mouse, but um, in the middle of the figure that you see here is the 15th and 16th of April 2020, where the temperature has increased by 30 degrees in less than 48 hours. And this was actually very scary. And that's why we took this event and looked at it into so much detail. So this is the event that you see in pink compared to the, and we will compare it to a background which you see marked in blue. So the, the background is the normal um, Arctic background. So the, the normal that is expected for April. And so now we look into detail what happened during this air mass intrusion. So the figure to the left 
shows you that the boundary layer height was increasing with the increasing temperature. So what this means is that there is more space for the for the particles or pollutants or gases to happen. So what we what we would expect is that the concentration of whatever is in the atmosphere to decrease. But this is not what we see. What we see to the figure to the right is the concentration or the mass of aerosols that has arrived to the central Arctic Ocean. And what we see here is that this warm air mass intrusion, which happened between the 15th and 17th of April, is composed of two peaks that are divided with precipitation. So this air mass came all the way from mid-latitudes. I will show you where it's coming from in the next slide. It came in, brought in so much aerosols, then some precipitation, local precipitation happened. And then after that, uh, another peak was, was also observed. And the levels of, um, of particulate matter, or what we call PM1, are extremely high for the Central Arctic Ocean. So this is what happened. Um, the figure to the left, the most left, is the background conditions of the Central Arctic Ocean. The star is where the ship was, which is in, in, in the center or in the North Pole. And then this first peak of the warm air mass inclusion arrived, as you can see from here. And the third one is arriving from here. And the darker the color is, the more temperature or warmth that this um, air mass is carrying. And I have pointed three points on the map here, which are in Eurasia or in, in Northern Europe and Asia, the Kola Peninsula, and uh, two other locations. And these locations are known for their coal and metal mining um, uh, industries. And the areas are actually very polluted. And what I want to point here is that this air mass has traveled less than 48 hours between these mid-latitudes and the, the Arctic Ocean. So it's actually extremely fast, but it still allows for a lot of processing and collecting whatever is there um, on the way. And in the next figure, I show you the same maps exactly, but now I show you the concentration of black carbon, which, which comes mostly from burning and, and mining and so on. And you can see that, again, the air mass is coming directly here from Vorputa and here from the Kola Peninsula. And what I'm trying to tell you here is that actually these intrusions, which are two peaks separated by precipitation, have completely different origins. So they are not from exactly the same area. And still the travel time of both together is less than 48 hours. This is just so fast. Um, uh, I want to add here also another thing is that why do we not see these intrusions the same everywhere? Uh, here is a picture of the 16th of April, so the, the more intense intrusion. This is Polarstern here in the center, and you can see the intrusion coming all the way from, from mid-latitude and is um, trapped basically in this area here, so that uh, in Greenland, for example, in Film Station, this warm air mass intrusion was not observed the same way. So, okay. The air mass intrusion happened. It's two peaks. Let's look at the chemical composition of the aerosol. So the figure to the left shows you the background concentration of uh, the composition of the mass, which is half sulfate and half organics in general, and it is less than two micrograms per meter cube. And then in the figure to the right, we see that the mass has increased, has tripled in the first case, and is, is five times higher on average uh, for the second peak. Um, and in the first peak, there is much more sulfate, while there is also ammonium. So what is happening is not only that we're bringing some aerosol into the Arctic, the composition of this aerosol is changing, the acidity of this aerosol is changing. And this matters for absorbing the gases that are in the atmosphere, releasing other gases, and it's important for all the processing that that could happen. So I will give you a little bit of uh, perspective for this uh, uh, mass that we see here. So I added my uh, observations from this warm air mass intrusion into a list of other European locations. And what I want you to take out of this is that the air mass intrusion is not falling in the same 
uh, mass category as, let's say, remote locations. Here it's a top of the mountain at 3,500 meters, but it's actually similar to uh, regional backgrounds or, or remote locations. And now if I even look further um, at the peak that is um, of this air mass intrusion, it actually falls between uh, Barcelona and Sirta, which are uh, urban locations in, in Central Europe. So what happened is that this super remote clear Arctic where there is nothing, where we expect to see nothing, has been transformed, transformed in less than 48 hours to an urban setting. And what does this mean? Yes, okay, there are aerosols. What happened next is that if we compare the total number of particles that have arrived to the Central Arctic Ocean accompanying this warm intrusion, we can see that there is more than a factor two higher. This is the, the pink plot compared to the total mosaic year. And now if we look at the cloud condensation nuclei, so these aerosol particles that we have around us can form cloud seeds. And so uh, a fraction of them can be forming clouds or affecting the cloud properties. And that's why this is important. That's why we look at also the aerosols that arrive to the Arctic and not only the worms or, or, the, or the moisture. And the figure that I show you to the right is actually how much more cloud condensation nuclei see accompanying with this warm air mass compared to the mosaic year. Um, why is this important? It's, like, it's because clouds in the Arctic act as warming blank blankets. So what I show you here is that the non-shaded area is, is uh, the, the, the warm air mass intrusion. At, and what we can see here is low level clouds and which are very opaque. And these could trap the radiation of the Arctic and help the early and uh, accelerated ice melt. And to go even further, um, I show here a figure where the um, Arctic sea ice extent in 2020 in July following the air mass intrusion or this extreme event, which is extreme in the last 40, in terms of the last 40 years, uh, I show that actually the Arctic sea ice extent is the lowest uh, compared to all the, the, the past 40 years, even compared to the record minimum, which was in 2012. And um, although we don't have like direct connections between the two events, um, there has been some modeling efforts showing that the two events are connected. So this extreme event that happened in April and the minimum uh, sea ice extent in July, 2020. Um, I will just jump to uh, another study that we also did. Um, and this is related not to directly the Central Arctic, but to the open ocean areas surrounding the Arctic. So we did some chamber studies here that show that the open oceans in the Arctic emit a molecule known as the iodic acid. And this iodic acid is a gas that once it's emitted can form a huge number of particles. And these particles, again, can grow further to become um, cloud seeds. So what we see here on the x-axis is this concentration of the iodic acid and the, part on the, and the particle formation rate. So how many particles per cubic centimeter per second are formed when you have this amount of iodic acid. And the figure to the right shows you that in the Arctic, so these two locations here where it was measured, that on more than, let's say, 60% of the time, the concentration of the iodic acid exceeds the, the normal average. And we expect a lot of particles forming whenever this open ocean becomes more open, let's say. So this is what's actually happening. So the warm air mass intrusions are coming to the Arctic, passing over open ocean surfaces, they are bringing warmth, moisture, and aerosol particles, which are basically home for cloud formation and cloud modification. Um, the clouds in the Arctic increase the downwelling radiation and help with surface heating, which um, induces early and accelerated ice melts. 
opening further the open oceans and the loop is continuing further and further. So what we learn is that the warm air mass intrusions are extreme. Although they are extreme and very few, we are expecting that they are increasing in frequency and duration in the, in the near future. If nothing is happening, they arrive from mid latitudes and they change the chemical composition of the Arctic aerosol. Um, they participate in forming clouds, which are thick and low um, in altitude, and they are even dense, opaque. Um, they are. They have been. This extreme event has been related to uh, minimum sea ice extent, and they pass over the open ocean, which also produces aerosols. So aerosol particles um, are forming, coming to the Arctic, and inducing ice melt even further. Um, and in a follow-up study, we are looking actually at more than this one extreme event to know whether they are all polluted and whether the impact of the intrusions that carry aerosols is the same as the ones that uh, do not. And this is a work in progress, which um, my colleague Helen Ago will uh, continue. So thank you for your attention, and I'm very, very happy to, to hear your questions. Yes, thank you, Lubna. Um, does anybody, that was fascinating. Does anybody have some questions? If, um, yeah, Jack has his hand raised. Go ahead, Jack. That was a very nice talk, Luna. I was just curious, you showed that warm air intrusion going right over Nealison. And I just was wondering if you or anyone else had looked at uh, the sort of pseudo Lagrangian connection between uh, Polar Stern and the measurements made at Nealison during this event, and whether the aerosols changed during those 48 hours or they just scooted out there straight from the pollution source. We, we actually did, and it is interesting that we see a lot of sulfate on Polar Stern, but nothing in Neolison. Um, but we do see SO2 in Neolison. So it is as if uh, only like the, the processing happened after uh, Neolison before it arrives to Polar Stern. Thanks. Other questions? Oh, bunch of hands. Um, Peng, go ahead, Peng, and then after Peng, Santiago. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I have a question about uh, uh, cloud nucleation um, part, like um, the aerosols that brought in by the warm air intrusion uh, brought in a large amount of aerosols. Um, do you have an idea of um, maybe the range of um, the number of concentrations or concentrations from aerosols uh, that, you know, Arctic cloud would be sensitive to. Is there a threshold, you know, uh, for cloud um, formation uh, that becomes, you know, not sensitive to, to aerosol concentrations or number yeah. of concentrations that would know that sometimes <laughs> polluted areas are yeah. saturated. Um, yeah, actually, this was one of the questions of the reviewers of the paper that we had. And uh, uh, I think Matthew would be the best to answer this question. But if I, if you want a, a quick answer, that would be 150 particles per cubic centimeter, uh, or our CCNs per cubic centimeter. Oh, so 150. 150? Or yeah. Exact number. OK, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, so the, oh, oh, go I ahead, mean, Peng. I, I was looking at the you know, uh, mosaic year, like the average is 100 something, and then the warming intrusion is like uh, 400, 500 something. So yeah. like, during this warm air intrusion, it's uh, like kind of already saturated for Yes, aerosol. that's true. That's true. You are right. Yes, you are right. So it is already saturated, but uh, it brought a lot of moisture as well. So that's something else to consider. And um, another thing is that um, then we just collect more folks. So maybe speciations. Yes, so it also affects the lifetime of the clouds. This is what I wanted to say. So it's not like a, a direct impact of um, 
of how many there are at this instant because they, it changes also the number of seeds per cloud. But if if you have um, so the, the longer effect would be the the lifetime of the cloud and precipitation as well. Okay, thank you, thank you, uh, Santiago. Yeah, it's just two pieces of information. Just curious. I'm curious about the uh, trajectory of the air parcel to get to the Polar Um I wonder, do you have uh, or do you have any feeling whether it was mostly boundary layer, free troposphere going up and down, or and also is any evidence of cloud processing? Um, so, the first, to answer your first question, both have. Uh, occurred below 1,500 meters. I'm sorry with the metrics. But, That's fine. And, <laughs> so, um, in, in actually, in the paper, I have a, a third plot where I show the, the level or the height of, of the intrusion. And they are all both uh, low intrusions and not uh, free troposphere. And uh, for your second question, with, there was no rain. If this is your question, what, there was no rain on the trajectory of Okay. of the of the yeah of the air mass okay and then the last question before our next speaker wilbert yes very nice presentation um on slide five you showed uh, the time series of temperature um and it shows that in after the uh, extreme events that the temperature remained uh, significantly significantly higher than before that um what, what is the reason for that so the, the, this is our intrusion that we studied, and this is the second intrusion that happened right after. So uh, the, the reason why we didn't study the second one in detail is because it's polluted with the polar stern stack. So we could not distinguish whether the aerosols are coming from long range or whether they are coming from the ship emissions that was measuring where we were measuring actually. And that's why we did not study this in detail. But I think, um, the normal temperature should be increasing like this in April because also um, now the radiation has uh, so it's it's um, it's it's no longer dark in the Arctic after this time period. So the temperature is systematically increasing after this time. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Lubna. That was that was great uh, presentation. Our our next speaker is Penny Valhos from the University of Connecticut, and she's gonna give an update on the Art of Melt expedition. Okay, so. That looks good. Good, all right, it worked. Thank you very much. Okay, so disclaimer, I am not an atmospheric scientist. I am an, a chemical oceanographer, biogeochemist working at the air-sea interaction boundary. Um, but uh, I, I believe it was Jesse Creeman who's part of this group who was kind enough to uh, recommend that uh, I share some of the information from our experiences on the cruise. So let's move on to the next. Okay, so uh, first of all, I'll go through setting the stage a little bit from our perspective, the Art of Melt Cruise. Uh, Luke, I know, is on the call, and um, he's one of the PIs that uh, was uh, very missed on the cruise, but I believe there's going to be a lot of interesting data um, that is going to be available for the community. And then I'll, I'll home in a little bit on our story, particularly in our group, and what we were focusing on. So um, I'm preaching to the choir, but we're all aware of the disproportionate importance that the Arctic Ocean has as a CO2 sink. And understanding the differences uh, with the changes that are anticipated in the Arctic environment are critically important uh, because of the importance of this sink. So um, our group had this opportunity to, to join the Art of Melt uh, really looking at the carbonate system. We're really interested in CO2 uptake and improving the parameterizations to um, estimate CO2 up uptake in a very changing Arctic Ocean with different ice coverage and so on. And uh, of course, we're uh, all aware that the uh, extent of ice is decreasing rapidly and uh, about 13% per decade. 
And it's uh, beyond just the, the extent of the ice. What we're really um, care about is the, uh, the thickness of the ice and the fact that um, multi-year ice, which is over uh, one meter, is going to be going extinct. And of course, that's a reservoir um, that a heat reservoir on the planet that is critically important. So, and, and this gives you an idea of uh, the extent of uh, the Arctic, the thicker ice that um, is in the Arctic and that only 7% of the Arctic ice cover uh, by the end of the year 2013 was considered old in that large reservoir. Now, going forward, the predictions are that by 2040, 2050, between that decade, that we're going to have completely ice-free uh, Septembers in the Arctic. And what that does to CO2 uptake, to biogenic gases, and to um, atmosphere-ocean interaction is all over the place in terms of uh, estimates and model estimates. And getting those parameterizations correct, um, again, very important. So uh, we go to the Art of Melt in 2023, and this is the uh, entire group. This is crew and um, scientists all together, and that was a national Swedish day. So I'll give you a, a timeline on the Art of Melt as we go forward and try to plan for follow-up uh, opportunities. So they, the, um, the entire proposal uh, was submitted in October, 2020. It was accepted in January, 2021. Between 2021 and uh, October 2022, there were several virtual workshops. Uh, breakout, first there was a, a call for general interest, and then there were uh, subgroup meetings depending on um, whether people were looking at uh, water sampling, ice sampling, or atmospheric sampling, aerosol sampling. The first in-person participant meeting was in October 2022, and then uh, mobilization, but most people, half the people didn't even know if they were funded at that point. So it wasn't until uh, November, December that everything was confirmed. And uh, then April 2023 was the mobilization. And the cruise uh, took, just took place recently. So we're, we're fresh off the boat. Uh, and it ended in June 15th. So uh, this here is uh, Mikel, the, the chief scientist of the cruise. And uh, the, just to, to quote the, there's an, a lot of information that's been put out uh, for any of you who are interested in individual work packages, but the overarching theme was of course to trace the, to track these atmospheric rivers and to try to uh, collide with at least one of these events. Um, there were 38 scientists, you can see here the numbers sometimes change, but 19 universities, 10 countries, and then 12 work packages, which had a slew of uh, measurements going on. And it was really, it was really run like a well-tuned, a well-conducted uh, orchestra. Um, I think that it was one of the, personally for me, it was one of the best cruises I've ever been on. The um, coordination between the PIs was wonderful, amiable, and uh, complementary. Um, now, I'll just give you a little bit on the on what at events we actually um, went through. So uh, we we did establish two ice camps, longer term ice camps. So if you take a look here at the cruise track, the red line shows you our our outgoing cruise track. The top red star that you see there uh, is the first day that we um, set up our first ice station, but then the ice flow just drifted as we were moored to it. And after six days, when we left the station, this was the, the our, our location. And just to explain what is happening here, because we were, there are a lot of jokes on this, on the cruise about spaghetti, uh, but originally the plan was, Mikhail's plan was that we were going to advance northward to 84 degrees north, uh, attach ourselves to the ice, and then wait for an intrusion and take it from there. Uh, apparently, um, the thicker ice was posing significant delays and concerns. And uh, when the pathways were, when they, you can note, you see here that there were times where they, the crew, they tried to work their way up, and then they basically hit thicker ice than they were expecting and then decided to set up stations. So that's exactly how we set up our stations. Each station was um, pending or following a failed attempt to, to move north. So um, the 
as I said, the first ice station was six days. And then the second ice station, uh, you see the northernmost blue dot here uh, is, again, we stayed on this station for 11 days and I will explain why. The idea was that we were going to stay at these stations until we saw a, a warm air intrusion. And unfortunately we did not, one did not occur during our trip except for the last week. That's when we finally got it. So the last few days were very exciting. There was still a lot of measurements to be had. And personally for my group, it was an extreme success. I believe every group was very happy with the unique data sets that they got, but we did not, uh, encounter one of the events that we were anticipating to the degree that we anticipated. So this again shows you the drifting idea so that we were always struggling with, well, you know, do we want to follow this or do we want to just keep steaming up again? But in the end, this was the final consensus between um, among all the, the PIs. And uh, just to give you an idea of the temperature profiles, you can see here in the red line, uh, the dotted lines show you the periods that we were at each ice camp. So the first ice camp, you can see that we want just barely hit um, over zero degrees. And uh, the temperature of scale here you could see is, is very modest. So these were very small. We were still excited about them, but there were small increases in temperature. So just several degrees. Uh, but we were able to, on the ice station, to see a significant amount of, amount of melt following this event. So there was um, very interesting data to be had from our perspective again. Here, this was the final event that was very exciting. Um, there, was an, there was a warm air intrusion while we were on Camp 2 that happened on the exact opposite side of the Arctic on the Russian coast. So we were not in the right place at the right time, nor could we make our way to it. But um, this final event was very exciting, very foggy. Uh, and for the atmospheric scientists, there was a lot of evidence of cloud condensation nuclei formation above the clouds. Uh, I'm sure there are gonna be a lot of exciting presentations at EGU to share that data. But um, this basically, was we knew this event was coming and that was the reason we made the decision to not steam up north again, but to, to wait at the station to capture this event. So that was um, a nice way to end the cruise actually, because we all had a sustained warming period that we could evaluate the melt processes on. And then here, just to put the year in context, I know uh, Lumna had a, a, similar figure, a similar comparison in her. So this is a, a good way to um, compare our year relative to the other. So the blue, of course, you see here is in 2023. And uh, you can see that it's interesting that we started off the year on uh, with lower ice coverage, but then it was just a slower melt process relative to the other years. And then um, here, finally, you know, now you can see that um, it was very similar to 2022, actually, if you take a look at the trajectory, but, um, and it and continues to be so. So, you know, based on, um, Mikael was uh, basing this on, you know, 2021, 2020, 2020, 2021 events, we were expecting something a little more, and 2019, that they would be a little more abrupt, that we would be expecting something down here, uh, which we did not, we did not see to the same extent. However, uh, again, Nobody was complaining in terms of, I think Mikael was probably the most disappointed, but uh, everybody else was very happy with the data sets that they were able to uh, achieve. And then uh, ice station logistics, uh, we did have over 30 polar bear encounters. And this is one of the images of uh, one of the encounters uh, and other problems were staying moored on the ice flow. There were often a lot of uh, collisions and pressures on the ship because of adjacent flows that were compressing. And oh, once the, I, th I think the most dangerous event that happened on the cruise was the snapping of the moor line. You can see here uh, the stress and the, the, the actual um, forensics of the, the broken um, anchors. So summary of the studies, we did not catch a persistent atmospheric river, uh, but we did finally get the rapid onset of ice melt ponds on that last warming event. The, um, 
the the number of ponds that formed over that 24 hour period were incredible. There was a, an abrupt change uh, over a very short period. But uh, the lack of uh, Arctic observations in spring ice melt periods still make this uh, an effort that's worthy of continuation. And you know, you never know um, where this is going to, you know, what year you're going to get ahead of time, a priori. So another thing is that there's a lot of attention going on for Arctic research right now. So as the scientists disembarked from the ship, the Crown Princess of Sweden and the Minister for Climate uh, and, the, and then the Ambassador for Climate uh, the, who are on this screen uh, here were all there on the ship. They boarded the ship and signed uh, an agreement with Norway to uh, further support Arctic research over the next couple of decades um, and recognizing the, the importance of this. So that was promising. So going forward, the Art of Melt uh, is going to have a full group uh, workshop, probably following EGU in 2024. That's the discussion right now. Uh, there's also conversation about an informal meeting uh, at AGU in 2023. And then uh, a couple of the PIs, I think it was Jesse Creeman who uh, coined the phrase into the melt, that um, after we saw the abrupt changes at the end of the cruise, uh, there was a lot of excitement. And uh, also, again, the synergy was just wonderful. So I think a lot of people would like to replicate this effort, but slightly uh, shifted to be further into the melt season uh, to try to, again, catch capture these events, but also just to study the melt process itself. Uh, because some of the abrupt changes we saw in the um, productivity that we saw uh, was, was incredible. So I'm just going to give you a brief uh, uh, background on our story and how we joined this cruise. So again, we're biogeochemists, and in 2021, we were doing carbonate chemistry in um, the Bering and Chechki Seas. And one of the um, components, you know, when our, our hypothesis is that uh, when, when you're trying to come up with carbonate chemistry calculations and you're using the standardized uh, methods that are out there, there are certain assumptions that go into them, and one of them is the boron to salinity ratio. So we were looking at the carbonate uh, parameters and also uh, hypothesizing that the boron to salinity ratio would not be similar than the, as to the open oceans in this melts region. And uh, again, that would include or imply that we would need to make corrections or at least consider this when we're making um, these calculations and, and possible estimates of CO2 drawdown. And I'm, I'm going to guess that you are all very familiar with this, but of course, uh, all of the dissolution reactions that happen in situ uh, all you know, calculate or connect back to our um, partial pressure of fugacity of carbon dioxide in the surface ocean and, uh, and that, um, efficient drawdown that you see in the Arctic. But what we don't know uh, in the Arctic is how uh, these, this drawdown shifts in changing ice fields and also for the Arctic Ocean for some of these extreme uh, conditions, we don't have a good hold on the equilibrium constants and the, um, they're not the one, they, most of them have not been derived under the extreme parameters to cover the extreme parameters. And of course, you know, if there are small changes in these values, then when you try to scale up for CO, large scale CO2 drawdown measurements, then, you know, your error is going to scale up as well. So these th seemingly small components like the boron to salinity ratio um, become very important when you're scaling up. So this is just giving you an example of some of the major components of total alkalinity. And, and boron is the third largest after carbonate and bicarbonate. So uh, if you haven't heard about it, don't worry. It is so important. Um, and of course, uh, it's also very sensitive to pH and it goes through the same type of speciation reactions. So when you have melting occurring and you've got these brine channels and these very beautifully complex systems, uh, things change around a lot. And so after we had um, that cruise, we went through and um, compared our values to uh, what is out there. So this is a cruise by um, Olufsen et al and Kitak Lee actually, uh, where they looked at the boron to salinity values. 
in uh, the region that we that the Art of Melt Cruise was also in. And then these, this just shows you the consistency across the global ocean. I won't spend time on that. And um, in, in this cruise, what ended up happening is that we, even though we were looking for uh, solid ice, before we actually made it to the station, so um, the ice had already retreated off the Alaskan coast and um, ended up being blown back. So we thought we were going to be chasing it, but we ended up just having to wait because it came back upon us. However, the problem was with that, that the, uh, the surface water had already been exposed to the atmosphere. So there, there had already been exchange. So uh, that was one of the factor, one of the things that Art of Melt offered to us that uh, we didn't have in this initial um, uh, opportunity. So this is just the boron to salinity results we got there. And you can see that there is significant deviation in the boron to salinity ratio in the ice cores and in, the, uh, in some of the underwater ice. So with this, we, uh, we put forth a proposal to go through and, and to try to, uh, to get onto a cruise where there was, a, there was gonna be more ice time, which we did get. So we did find a significant difference in the boron to salinity ratio. And, um, and then uh, we called NSF, they uh, hooked us up with, uh, it was Frank really, who told us about the Art of Melt Cruise and we were, it was just the right amount of time. Um, and then we were <laughs> confirmed for funding in December 2022, maybe end of November 2022. So we we're kind of hanging on the end of our seats. And then um, we're just going to skip that again. Fun. Yeah. And then so our objectives on this cruise were to look at all the carbonate parameters, the boron to salinity ratio, uh, but to do this in annual versus multi year ice and brine. And then to evaluate the changes over the uh, at an, a single ice station over the ice melt process, and uh, uh, we had fantastic support from the Polar Secretariat. Uh, they were uh, allowed everybody. They worked so flexibly with everybody to to try to accommodate certain designs or even changes in design, experimental design when it happened. And uh, I basically don't believe, unless there was weather, a, a serious weather condition, we were never told no to something that we wanted to do. The other best part was, uh, one of the best parts was that we had helicopter time that was significantly more available than we expected. We had been told that it would only be available uh, rarely, but we basically had the helicopter on demand, um, or on demand, and uh, it, it took us to other ice flows where we could compare different quality ice and so on. So that was fantastic. Uh, this was our, our wet lab over here and we had all our carbonate instruments and that's uh, Samantha Rush, who is the PhD student who's gonna be working uh, on, um, on this work. So for our group personally, we took 17 cores profiles and uh, sectioned them all and then did detailed carbonate chemistry uh, on the individual uh, sections. And uh, we also had, so the cores that we were able to capture range from about 60 centimeters to 180 centimeters. We also have, um, we sampled on five CTD casts, but for Luke, who's on this call, if he's still on, um, there's a lot, there were a lot of casts that were conducted. Uh, they, I believe they had over 20 casts during the cruise. So there's a lot of information. And then uh, we have most of our carbonate numbers were done on the ship. So we have all of that, but we still don't have the boron numbers. Those are going to be done um, in Korea, actually, at Kidek Lee's uh, lab, uh, probably in September. The samples just arrived yesterday in Korea. So we're, we know they arrived safely. So uh, we just are going to be having a lot of fun dissecting the core profiles with the different carbonate parameters and then checking out you know, how they compare to the equilibrium constants that are already provided in some of the um, established methods out there. And then we also saw some cool variation in the ice cores in terms of buffering capacity. So the DIC, total inorganic carbon to total alkalinity ratio. And um, we did see that there were, in, in all cases, you kind of see, you see that uh, the ice is going to be um, a, a great sink but then there were some exceptions that uh, are gonna be very interesting to evaluate because we have more biogeochemical parameters. 
Uh, we did spec pH, of course, for the uh, so three decimal places and had those profiles in the ice as well. And then we also did spec carbonate values, which we hope are gonna lend some um, inf information uh, for the boron anomalies that we see the boron to salinity ratio anomalies. I think this is gonna help that as well because we'll be able to see uh, different kinds of um, precipitation, potential for precipitation reactions. And uh, we also had continuous total alkalinity uh, from uh, using a, high, a Contros um, T, a total alkalinity analyzer. So we have that. And then uh, we also had um, uh, CSENS, Turner CSENS PCO2 probes that we put right into the brine cores, in the cores. So we were able to get very quick, um, a few, uh, partial pressure differentials between the, the overlying air and the brine uh, in different uh, ice flows. So uh, we've, I'm not gonna go through this form because you guys probably don't wanna learn about the carbonate system. <laughs> I wasn't sure how big the audience was gonna be and how far we'd go, but we have a lot of um, other analyses that are, we're planning, including uh, DNA analyses in our, that with the colleagues on Lin here at the University of Connecticut. Uh, we also are going to be doing O18 profiles on the cores, and that's the group that was uh, that was on the Lucy, or I mean, sorry, the Samantha and Lauren who were on the cruise, and that's all I got for you guys. But I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Penny. We have about five minutes for questions. Thanks for sharing uh, about this this very fresh. Cruise, um, exciting results. Back, oh good, got you back. Um, yeah, I think there's there are going to be some great results. There was um, uh, there was during that last event, uh, people got really excited about right above the the clouds. There uh, some particle formation that was uh, detected, and uh, I think there's so many complementary types of observations that were made at the same time that there are going to be some really nice processes revealed. So Matthew's inviting you to AGU session C14. <laughs> okay. The coupled system processes of the central Arctic atmosphere, sea, ice, ocean system, harnessing field observations and advancing models. I think, Matthew, how many more days do we have to get our abstracts in? One week, I think. Uh, one one week. week. Okay. And to everybody else, I mean, this theme that we've been talking about would fit that session very nicely. So, uh, and we've had a great session for the last three years. So we expect a really nice session this year coming up that addresses a lot of these same topics we've been talking about here today. Wonderful. And Penny, it sounds like people are scheming to do a art part two, the Into the Melt. Yes, I think there is a lot of support for that. All right. Well, think about finding a way to get NSF or someone, one of these other funding agencies to help pay to get involved in this project. But um, other, other questions? I know it's we just have about two minutes. Well, Santiago has a question. Uh, yeah, I mean, but I just wrote it. Uh, yeah, but uh, did you guys run into any? Uh, yeah, smoke? that's this is the second time I see Santiago today. Our second meeting together. So, yes. <laughs> yes. hello. So, <laughs> no, we did not. However, uh, I think some of it might come out in some of the the mass spec um, analyses, but we didn't know, see something that was like a clear pulse. It might have been going on over your head and not. Reach yeah, the right. Yeah. All right. Uh, that's a great way to end it, everybody. We, uh, I'd like to thank our speakers again and all of you for joining us. And um, Hazel might not, I can't remember um, what our next topic is going to be next month, but um, We'll we'll get back. We'll make sure we send an email to all the folks who attended just to invite them to our next meeting. 
Yeah, that sounds like a great approach. I am not sure. And I'm trying to put the link to make an account, um, but I can't quite figure it out. So <laughs> okay. uh, just go to iarpiccollaborations.org. I should know um, and I can't remember. So all right, I, well, I have the link. I just can't copy it properly. OK. Oh, thank there you, it is. Liz. Thank you, Liz. Um, I got yeah, it. Thank you all for joining today. Thank, thank, you. thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your summer. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.